Earl Lewis, the director of the Center for Social Solutions at the University of Michigan. You, you spend your life with young people at the yeah. University of Michigan. You teach there. Will American democracy or can it be saved by, by youth? Are we forgetting the, the, the demographic element here? I, I, whenever I get really down in the dumps about uh, the nature of American democracy, I look at 18 year olds. And I used to say this when I was a professor and then I was a dean and I was a provost and I was still saying it. You know, I mean, I would say to my students, I want you to get angry in a protest. I want you to be on and believe in something so passionately that you're willing to put your life on the line for it because you are hope. If you can't believe between 18 and 21 you can change the world, the rest of us be damned because we're in real trouble. Uh, and so I go to colleges and universities, not only my own, but all over the country. And I'm still reminded how passionately young people uh, believe that they can perfect this union. They really do believe it. Uh, and then in some ways they're the heirs of the young men and women, teenagers who uh, were on the front line in Little Rock uh, going into Central High School or in Selma uh, for almost four years in 61 to 65. We know about 65, not knowing that students were mobilizing and on the streets starting in 1961. I was born into the segregated South in 1955. I became part of what I refer to as a transitional generation. Those folks who went to segregated schools until they were in the ninth to 10th grade, circa 1970. What was that like, by the way, going to a segregated school? It was a reminder of the fact that that notion of uh, equal opportunity for all didn't play out in the same way. I mean, on one hand, it was healthy because people had, the teachers had assumptions about you and held you uh, in high regard, but you also knew you didn't have the resources that some of the schools that had majority white students had. Mm. And that uh, there was also, you were stamped. I mean, it's like you were stamped from the beginning as part of a people uh, who had come to these shores and were uh, very soon thereafter enslaved. Are we done with that now? At least in terms of American democracy, this segregated system, this hierarchy of whites and blacks? No, we are not. I mean, and in some ways, we have not, in my view, dealt with one of the original sins of this nation and this democracy, which was slavery. Uh, well, we, it's the original sin. The, well, it, 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 one could debate that or uh, the confiscation of the lands of Native Americans, right. but very uh, equally. But slavery uh, dominated the American political economy for 60% 60, 60 of our history. Uh, and then it had its after effects um, with segregation and now mass incarceration. How, how is it possible that slavery, this terrible sin against humanity, how, how is it possible that it coexisted with a certain kind of democracy? Obviously, yeah. it didn't incorporate African Americans. It didn't, for a long time, it incorporate women. Yeah. Um, but it still grew. What was the relationship between the development of, 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 of democracy and the original sins of the American Republic? Yeah, and it's a fascinating question because what it says is something that those framers of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights had some sense that indeed all were endowed with certain inalienable rights and they were created equal at sub four. And then you sort of began to sort of parse it out. But African Americans, Native Americans, women and all spent the better part then of the next 200 years fine tuning and refining the whole notion of the American compact and the American promise, that democratic promise saying it can't be fully democratic if we're excluded. Uh, so it, it's that way of, it's almost like thinking you have a stone or a tablet where some parts of it are written, but then it has to be rewritten and re-chiseled a little bit uh, to really come into full form. But the original idea of, of, of American democracy was also founded on Madison's idea that we're not angels. Yeah. And that the separation of powers and the very nature of government was premised on, on our self-interest. Yeah. We can be self-interested and have a viable democracy at the same time, can't we? We can be. Um, clearly, that's in some ways my previous life as a philanthropist. Uh, philanthropy is about uh, the, ac the accumulation. You ran the Mellon Foundation. I ran the Mellon for what, Foundation. Five years? Five years as president of the Mellon Foundation, uh, one of the leading, leading private foundations in the United States. And part of that was the accumulation of capital over almost 50 years. And by the time I left, it was worth just under $7 billion. 
uh, we would distribute about 5% of that per year. There was a self-interest there, of course, to continue to grow and accumulate additional capital, but it was also a self-interest directed at then how do we redefine the common good? And I think that's the balance between uh, one can be self-interested, but one also has the question, how do we redefine the common good? But you also, are you also suggesting that if, we, if this inequality that, that has marked our society so dramatically, this growing inequality that's marked our society so dramatically over the last 20, 25 years, if this continues to grow and if you continue to have a tiny group of extremely wealthy people yeah. and an underclass and a, and a shrinking middle class, are you suggesting that that might spell the death knell of democracy itself? Even if that democracy, as you suggested, never was and maybe never will be ideal. You know, and that's a hard question to answer only because democracy operates both at sort of the meta level as we think of the Constitution, but then also at the community level. I mean, down to the school board and the library council and the Rose Commission. Uh, and so at some level, I actually think democracy on the ground in local places and spaces will continue. Our ability to effectively create a national state however, may be uh, challenged uh, forever unless we can begin to figure out to make sure we don't divide the loaf so unevenly that some people are only uh, the winners and a lot of people believe they have no stake in the future of society. So you're stressing the sort of the Tocquevillian yeah. analysis of democracy, but isn't that itself endangered by the disappearance of small town America? Um, and the undermining of local communities? You know, I, I just came back from Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, I was there on, um, over the weekend. And, yeah. and Fargo, 100,000, 110,000 people or so, is a big city in North Dakota. Uh, but there are a lot of people who live on small farms and in rural areas. And while they're declining, they haven't disappeared. And what's remarkable to me is to actually talk to folks uh, in, in Minnesota and in Michigan where I live now uh, in these small towns, or even when I go back to my native Virginia, people still do live in these towns. Uh, and that uh, indeed some commute into the big cities to work, but they go back, they buy property, they invest in certain things. I'm not sure, I'm, notwithstanding what some argue, I'm not sure small town America has disappeared completely or will disappear completely in our, at least in my lifetime. Um, but, but to your point, yeah, I mean, clearly the economics uh, of organization, uh, Reading, Pennsylvania today is not a Reading, Pennsylvania of 35 years ago. We have to figure out though, how do we begin to frame it such that it's not a winner take all or lose, a, lose out completely, that in some ways it's not about whether your family came from A, B, or C place. Uh, it's, how do we structure America now so that everyone has a fair shake and some opportunity? You know, if you think about the next 10, 15 years, so McKinsey came out with a study 2017 that projected worldwide 800 million jobs that had existed in 2015 will have disappeared by 2030. 54 million in the United States, one third of the contemporary American workforce, all to automation. And it's not just, um, as we imagine, blue collar jobs, not truck drivers is where much of the stories is uh, focused for the last few years, but also uh, accountants, uh, anything that can be automated, I have been told by, CEOs of major corporations will be automated. So that anxiety is real. So what you're saying is that the, the populist rage today um, will be nothing compared to the, the rage of tomorrow as a consequence of technological unemployment. I actually think that uh, if, if, if people want to be scared about something, uh, be scared about a future where you can't answer the question, what do I do? And how will that compound racial inequalities and racial sensitivities. Yeah. It will suggest that we now, 2019, need to pause long enough to say, look, the growing diversity of the United States is actually an asset, but it's only an asset if we define it as such. We have to define it as an asset, we have to value it as an asset, 
We have to leverage it, it as an asset. If we do that, we can then figure out a way uh, to make sure that all participate in some way in this future. I mean, and, and I can illustrate it with a, little, a quick little story. So there was an event uh, a few years ago in Southern California. Uh, and there was a town meeting and people were sitting around and they were talking about raising taxes. And one guy got up and goes, why do I, I don't want to raise my taxes. I mean, my kids are out of the house. Why would I want to raise my taxes for someone else's kids? And one of his neighbors got up and says, can I turn to that gentleman and ask a simple question? I have three questions, in fact. One, do you ever plan to retire? And the guy said, yes. Do you plan to sell your home when you retire? He go, yeah. He says, well, who do you think is going to buy your home? It's those other people's kids. Your investment now is a down payment on your future and your retirement. And, and, and for a little second there, the light bulb went off in his head. And he realized it was not a story of us and them. And it's just some sense of then this community that is at the heart of the democratic promise that was the original framing of the United States. This is a theme that's come up a lot, actually, in these yeah. conversations, is the theme of leadership yeah. and responsibility, a certain kind of moral bravery. Why aren't we getting that? Again, should we be nostalgic for a Roosevelt, a Churchill, a de Gaulle, maybe even a Clinton or an Obama, yeah. um, or perhaps even a, a George Bush? Yeah. Um, what's gone wrong with the production of elites in this country that they're not able to, to tell the truth anymore, particularly truths that are going to be unpopular? Yeah. I remember a day when we define a generation as 25 years. And so in 25 years, you got to see the arc of change over um, a number of places and spaces. Now in a digital age, a generation is 18 months. So we can blame it all on Facebook, Earl? Uh, only, not all on Facebook. <laughs> not all on Facebook. But it's the way in which we are processing information mm. uh, and how quickly we are. I, mean, I, I can remember some friends of mine who used to be commentators on CNN and others saying to me, uh, you have to feed the beast. It's 24-7. Uh, we have to have enough there to keep viewers mm. coming back. And so uh, feeding the beast uh, required us then to also um, scale up in one area down, and dumb down in an, another area. Uh, and you have these repeated cycles. But part of what we know is that also understanding requires moments for reflection. And if you're attached to your gadget and it's going off with news alerts every 24 seconds, uh, you are being pulled and not always processing. Everything. And those alerts, unfortunately, they're not always news alerts. They're alerts about your own Instagram page. Your Facebook Instagram page and, and Facebook. And then everything gets personalized. And, and everything gets personalized. And then what we learned in this last election is that it also can be manipulated. And you get a president who is a master manipulator, but is also himself manipulated by the system yeah a sort of a, a supreme narcissist yeah. and what in the past we had presidents who had quote-unquote character flaws but we didn't see them by the second we mm. i mean there was no twitter handle that allowed them to uh send us and their immediate thoughts on any given topic there was a way in which if we saw it it was going to come because we would read about it later in this change between lbj and someone on the phone would mm. be read about through uh, scholars going into the National Archives looking at the phone log and realizing LBJ was berating someone uh, and all. Uh, today, unfortunately, we all get to watch it in real time if we're so inclined. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, for those who believe in chaos theory, uh, we get a little bit of a daily version of chaos. So, Earl, uh, enough doom and gloom. Let's yeah. finish on some positive notes. Yeah. You've described a, 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 a democratic system that isn't healthy, but you've also suggested that it's never been that healthy, that it's always been corrupted by one thing or another. What do we need to do now concretely? What, what are, give me two or three things that we can do collectively, maybe in political terms or even as individuals, to strengthen, to save American democracy. So first thing, I think we can invest in communities and individuals. Leaders actually are oftentimes exist at the local level. 
invest in those leaders, uh, invest in certain ways. My old life is philanthropy. Philanthropy should be investing in institutions and organizations that are trying to actually look to the future, support. So you ran the Mellon Foundation. What one investment are you most proud of in that context? You ran it for four or five years. You gave, her a, you gave away billions of dollars. What are you particularly proud of? Uh, I am delighted to say that we, uh, we put our money uh, behind what we believe in uh, and diversified the number of colleges and universities we supported. Um, uh, more like uh, Hispanic serving institutions than ever been uh, the case in Mellon's history. Uh, a wider range of HBCUs and not just uh, our friends in the Ivies and the Little Ivies. Uh, we began to uh, support public institutions uh, and we did this across a whole spectrum, not just higher education, the arts. Uh, we went out and even did something that we had said we would never do at one point, which is to underwrite documentaries because we realized that uh, there's a way in which in this age uh, people learn in different ways than just reading a book. And then not everyone, of course, for better or worse, has millions or billions of dollars to give away. For the people watching this who don't but who care, what can they do? So then it actually, again, I go back to the community. Uh, go and ask, what can you change in your neighborhood, your block? Because you can become frustrated thinking you're going to change Washington. You may by voting someone in or voting someone out, but you can change your block. You can change your neighborhood. You can do it in coalition uh, with others. It sometimes requires you to stand up and say, all right, I'm going to take it upon myself. To so talk uh, to your neighbors. To not only just talk to your neighbors, to organize your neighbors. It's not one thing to talk to them, it's another thing to organize them. Uh, to knock on the door and say, I'm signing this petition or we're going to go down to the, uh, to the city council uh, to affect change in this manner. I mean, I think that's actually critically important. So democracy can be strengthened from below I rather think, than from above. I think democracy has to always be strengthened from below because uh, the process of change uh, at the top can sometimes take two years or six years, depending upon which elected official you're trying to push. And there are pro projects that I know, I mean, I'll give an example. Uh, the Smithsonian uh, recently opened a National Museum of African American History and Culture. It took 100 years uh, to get that built on the mall. It was first proposed in 1915. It was 2015 before it ever saw the light of day. It had pretty to go, I've been there. It's pretty amazing. It's amazing, but it had to go through a whole series of congressional um, twists and turns uh, before it ever was approved uh, and was approved on George W. Bush's watch, uh, which was a, a great thing. But if you're hoping that kind of change is going to happen overnight, you know, some, some issues are 100 year issues and you just have to fight for it for 100 years. Other things you can change uh, more immediately, uh, more readily by actually organizing uh, from the ground up. And, and I'm actually optimistic. And, and what I would say in the end is also figuring out what are the issues to change. I mean, I'm, this new Center for Social Solutions that I've founded uh, at the University of Michigan is working on four problems because we think they can be addressed uh, in part uh, over the next decade. And one dealing with how do we indeed value diversity uh, for helping sustain a prosperous democracy. How do we begin, second, how do we begin to address our slavery past because we can't get forward if we can't deal with the past. And then the next one is about uh, climate change in a particular kind of way. Is there a way to actually design a regional demonstration project that can be scaled nationally and exported globally for moving water from flood prone areas to drought stricken areas? Uh, and then the last is actually perhaps the biggest one of them all. How do we really wrestle with the dignity of labor in an automated world? If you believe, as I mentioned, that McKinsey report, uh, then um, the dignity of labor uh, for most Americans will be the most bruising question that they're going to confront in the next 15 to 20 years. Mm -hmm.